But we have 30 more seconds to talk about whatever. It's Do we long. have hands that got it? Mm -hmm. All hands right. It. All yours. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pat Conroy Literary Center's monthly virtual open mic in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association. Um, tonight, our featured writer is an uh, award winning novelist. Susan Zarenda, uh, author of uh, books for Eli. So um, I know most of you will be reading and some of you may not. I know Barb, you said you weren't gonna be reading, but uh, I do have our uh, three person lineup to begin with. Um, so just let me know. Uh, Susan McCartney, we're gonna start with you. Oh, and then we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're gonna go uh, to Barry next. And then Estelle, are you reading? Yes, I'll read. <clears throat> okay, all right. Um, well, that's our order to begin with. So Susan, if you'd like to start us off. <laughs> okay, this is a little longer than usual. You know, usually I have like three paragraphs. This is a little longer. Um, November 14th, 2008, into Africa I fly on a one-way ticket, journey through 14 countries in 22 months on local transportation learn, rest, change. A woman among men without advantage of youth or money. The journey has many pieces. This is one. December 2nd, 2008, to Zaire, oasis in southwestern Tunisia on the northern fringe of the Sahara Desert. Heart wonders. I drink handfuls of sweet water from a round stone well in Old Town. Sunny fingers twist through lanes between brick shops. Every manner of Tunisian treads these lanes. Turban Berbers, swarthy Arab, coal black descendants of Berber and Arab slaves, jeweled Berber women in scarlet, Muslim women dressed in black like me. I enter thick darkness of a regal shop rake sand floor, blue bowls, glow pebbles of frankincense and mere, woody lemon, black licorice. No invasion of movement or sound in the shadowy shop. Images gradually present themselves, rows of hanging garments. I thumb a row of pastel camel cloaks. He steals behind me like a thief. Madam, may I offer you tea? Timbers of his voice touch my crazy bone. His gray toga drapes like royal robes, ringless hands clasp, green eyes dazzle shadow. He bows low. I want him to lift his head, light me again with those eyes. His mind, my mind casts about. I'm interested in a camel cloak, not pastel, dark brown like the one hanging by itself. He takes the cloak off its lone peg. In Tunisia, the cloak is called a barnous, usually worn only by men. This brown one is my own, not for sale, except to you. Sarah, I'm Sarah. My name is Thuria. He wraps me in the brown cloak, head to heels, loose and free. I lift the tasseled hood, turn twice in a circle, rub my cheek against toasty male scents in the soft wool. His laughter reaches out, catches me. I slip off the cloak, sit on pillows at the low round table across from him, his sculpted jaw, slow proud mouth, hair dusted silver. Cluttered pleasures rise, my skin is hot. He pours tea. Have you been to the desert? Yes, well, through it on the train, the jeep. Did it sing to you? The desert? Yes. I smile, no, I'm surprised. The desert chooses who hears its song. You are chosen, I am sure. Dunes shift and whisper, catch the wind. Pitch low melody in daylight that broods hollow at night. Desert demons, some say, I do not agree. I hang on minor keys in his voice, like warming up to sting. He offers biscuits cloth wrapped in a woven basket. Desert wind and sand will dance forever. Wind teases small dunes to climb larger ones. 
persuades monster dunes to crawl across each other. I soak in wild poetry of this charmingly dominating man. Lilts of his voice make me dizzy. Sarah, let me take you to the desert. Explore paths where free, made free by line and space. Sleep in kingly comfort of a silken tent under silk, silent moon shadow. Another person inside me wants to tumble into his warm, sure hands. Feel soundless explosion, hear magic whisper. His words troll my milk glass heart. Come with me, Sarah. Open your hand. Follow dream. My voice is small. Serious. Savage places are balm to me. Since childhood, under beds, around corners, down roads. Now Africa. Tomorrow I leave to there. Follow my own dream. He barely breathes. Some travel the world without hearing its song. You will dance. My long shadow runs ahead of me down the lane. Soft moans follow. Thuria stands in front of his shop, head thrown back, arms spread in evening light. I smile at his dashing drama. The fickle life of desert beans. Thuria will venture new means as soon as tomorrow. I wonder though, if not in ten on roaring dreams of back roads when he galloped in, would I have let that music begin again? Past love songs creak and sway my mind. Weeds of memory twine and knot. A slice of moon moves across the sky. No. Safer for me to give my heart to no one. Move like a stick down a stream. Caught up now and then. And. Uh. Thank you. Your word Your pictures. pictures. Your word pictures are simply wonderful. Yeah, they're better like than my when I. <laughs> Watching a movie, yes, it's a, it's a little more descriptive. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Barry? Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I've been reading mostly these last few months from my poetry book, which I'm not going to read from tonight, but I can hold it up anyway. Maybe today, available on Amazon and barry-dixon.com. But I want to read from my other, uh, uh, I have another manuscript out there of micro memoirs called Barry Who? 33 Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. <laughs> and it's real incidents from my life. And I've read a lot of the shorter ones here, but I have a whole bunch that I'd never touched here that I, I've read in some of the other Zooms. How many remember Angela Davis? Anybody who doesn't? Oh, yeah. Okay, so some of you younger folks might not. She was a, an activist, a civil rights activist, uh, very militant, admitted Marxist. And this is one of the memoirs in the book, June 29th, 1972. Angela Davis visits Madison Square Garden they kept the Nazis behind barricades. That's right, Nazis. Some called them white supremacists. The New York Post referred to them as, quote, a right-wing militia group, end quote. But let's face it, they're Nazis. There were about 12 marching in a circle, carrying placards with such messages as white power, red menace, Welcome to Jew York. And one with the drawing of a tree limb, it said, black humor. A communist preaching inside, Nazis marching outside. Welcome to New York in the early 70s. A ring of spectators was right up against the barricades. Marchers and spectators could practically touch. I was just passing by when I noticed the gathering. I walked over, observed a moment, then wiggled my way to the front. 
I stood against a wooden horse barricade. One Nazi passed so close, I could smell the alcohol on his breath. Round and round, they slowly marched, holding their placards. They alternated between a strained silence when all you could hear was their footsteps and a chant, white power, white power. At some point, the spectators began to fill the quiet moments with catcalls. Go home, racist. Yeah, while well, you still can. The marchers did not respond. They just kept marching round and round. They didn't even look at the hecklers. Nazi discipline. How about I take that sign and shove it you know where? One spectator called out. This was getting tense. These Nazi guys, I thought, they could easily be armed, if not with guns, certainly with knives. I couldn't believe how close they let us get. They, I suddenly realized, was two cops, two. A police force of 25,000 Nazis marching in front of a mixed race crowd and all they could muster was two cops? Maybe I should go home but I was transfixed. I thought, okay, if you're gonna stay, keep your mouth shut. That's a given. I looked behind me to see how deep the spectators were. If something blew, I wanted to make sure I had an escape route. The heckling intensified, but the Nazis stayed disciplined, even in the face of dumb shit, honkies, let's kick their ass. But there was this one marcher, at least six foot two, about 20, strong build, dark brown crew cut. He took long steps as he marched, not quite goose steps, but reminiscent. Several times I saw him glance quickly at the hecklers, just for a second, then he'd look straight ahead again. His face was getting angrier and angrier. I couldn't help but think, these are the people, the kind who killed my grandfather's family, great-grandparents, cousins, anyone who hadn't emigrated. Don't ask how many, nobody knows. I started feeling the catcall urge myself. But Barry, but no, Barry, be smart. These people are dangerous. Then, just as the guy with the crew cut passed, a heckler near me called out, white trash. Suddenly, he looked over his shoulder at the heckler, and I could see the rage on his face. His eyes were demonic. I'm going to cut your balls off. He spit a little as he said it. I looked right into those eyes. I was dying to say something, but warned myself again. Shut up, Barry. Like Grandpa used to say, don't mix in. But it didn't work. Yeah, I said, then you'll finally have a pair. <laughs> he looked directly at me and glared. Uh-oh, I thought, here he comes. But for some reason, the marcher behind him kept marching and bumped into him. He looked at the marcher, back at me, turned and resumed marching. When he came around again, he didn't even look up. Even if he did, I had already backed into the crowd. About 20 minutes later, they stopped. They gathered their placards, walked out of the barricades, escorted by the two cops, got into a couple of station wagons that seemed to come out of nowhere and drove away. To this day, I cannot believe I said that. Thank goodness I escaped with my life. I wish I could say the same for my grandfather's family. Thank you. <clears throat> Sounds all too familiar, Barry. <laughs> What's that? Sounds sounds so familiar. It, it, we're there again. Oh yeah. Yeah. So sad. Well depicted. Thank you. Mm. Okay. 
Estella, you are. Oh, Estella, you're muted. I'm mute. I think I said something while I was muted too, but Estella, you're you're still muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was just going to say, Angela Davis. You didn't mention her. I'm sure that it was very exciting. She actually grew up in Birmingham. She was in the middle of, of the children's marches where, where all that was going on was where she grew up. I always, uh, that gave me some idea of the fervor that came, oh, and a house across the street from them. They were okay. The neighbor said they were okay as long as they lived on that side of the street. And then some, a black family moved in across the street and their house was bombed to smithereens. Oh my gosh. So that's what Angela was growing up with. She's still, uh... She's still active out there. She's mm -hmm. yeah. She how old is she? Seventy seven. Wow. Yeah, she's teaching my age in, in, Cal <laughs> in California somewhere at a one of the universities. I'll be seventy seven on August twenty four. And her daughter is uh, active now. Looks just like her. Hmm. Wow. Not that the media doesn't have them in their focus though, right? Uh, I see her on TV occasionally. Yeah. Why am I so dark? <laughs> no, you were coming. Yeah, I know you're flashing dark to light, Barry. You really? get really dark and then you you get lights to shine on me. It's when like I somebody's know. turning the lights off and on. FYI. <laughs> I really liked what you wrote. It was really thank you. It did take some balls <laughs> to say that. Was, I don't know whether it took balls or stupidity. Yeah. This was a tough crowd. These people. Yeah. In New York, tough town, home of the brave, right? So here we are 50 years later. Mm, what progress we've made. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've made some progress. The vice president is a black woman. That's progress. Just different players. Estelle, are you? Yeah, we're different, different players, already. different colors. So the players yeah, are different colors. Okay, I was okay. going to say, Estelle, before you read, I was going to list off the, uh, Lisa, are you reading? Okay, so I have Lisa, Jane, and Jackie. Yeah. After, after Estelle. Terrific. Okay. Well, we'll go back another 50 years kind of in, in theme. This is a short story, and I won't read all of it because I don't have time, but I'll read part of it. It's called Fish Camp. Her dog, always the bird dog, ran to the bank of windows on the marsh side of the house and raised a ruckus. The barking jarred Sasha into action as she opened the door. Jojo ran for the dock. The source of alarm appeared against the green of the marsh and the blue, green, brown of the water. Several stoop-shouldered dark silhouettes lined the dock walkway. All were turned north, facing the wind. She looked for the attraction. She'd never seen buzzards on the dock. Always, it was white egrets or great blue, sometimes a green heron or a little blue heron, even an immature night crowned black heron. The matures of these were more secretive, preferring the freshwater pond back on the property. Sasha looked in the direction of the buzzards. And, and, excuse me, Sasha looked in the direction of the buzzards were gazing and saw nothing. Then she walked a few steps back toward the cabin and turned and looked again. Something was in the water. A form lay in the tall grass. A dark profile spread in the brilliant green growth that formed an emerald screen at the waterline. It was high tide, so the usually muddy banks of the river lay beneath, no longer in view. No more oyster exhalations. It was afternoon, so no more sharp morning nospy cries as chicks demanded fishing action from mom. She returned to the fish cabin, camp cabin to look for binoculars so she could determine the form in the water. It was large, a human body. The air held no unusual smells as she raised the glasses to her eyes. She could make out the silhouette of a rounded ball next to a larger form. The ball was half submerged and larger than a softball. 
Next to it, the body of something eluded her eyes. By this time, six turkey vultures had lifted up vast wings and departed from the dock. She adjusted the glasses and saw that the shapes in the water could be a very distended head or body part. A chill crawled up her chest. She felt the dock vibrate and heard the thump of a foot hitting the wood planks behind her. She turned and saw the shrunken form of her stepfather wearing a black t-shirt and struggling along the expanse. He had brought them to this home when she and her mother came to live with her him 20 years ago. She was 10 at the time. The house was a fisherman's rustic and leaky getaway, one Jack had renovated skillfully for his permanent home. Now, however, his bald head and hollow cheeks under the Marine Corps ball cap changed him almost beyond recognition to her now that she was visiting back after more than a year. He limped closer and his cane bonked on the boards in a slow rhythm. There's something you might want to see out here, she told him. She watched the vultures watching the carcass in the water. Who do you think they're waiting for? she said, nodding toward the form. Even under the aviator sunglasses he wore, she could see Jack screw up his face to gaze where she looked. Probably the carcass is too distended, Jack's, Jack's voice was raspy and low. It's a deer, a young one, I think. He continued looking. Turkey vultures are known to, call, to send out calls for miles around when they need help, so these may be distant flocks. None of them has been able to pierce the pelt and the skin to get what's inside. Ew, I know it's a shitty way to live this, leave this earth. In Vietnam, we had to call in medivacs as soon as we could so we could get our dead and wounded out. Vultures over there were real aggressive in taking over anything dead. Now suffering from myriad ailments and a sure death sentence, Jack struggled, struggled to speak unless it was about his service 50 years ago. Sasha didn't say anything. She knew he'd had a hard time in Nam and that it left scars. At least that's what her mother told her when she was younger and she's raised it at her stepfather when he cursed her for her slow response to an order and then have to go to her room. Or when he was into his beers and chasers and when all bets were off and he threw things and threatened her mom. It was a regular part of growing up, arriving scared at a motel late at night, angry later when her mother chose to take them back to the house. The couple would make up a month later, there'd be a repeat. So I'll stop there. There's more. But that's the first part of it. Wow. That's a prevailing theme I've heard in several of your stories, or at least one I can think of. Uh, makes me think of swamp, uh, swamp viruses. Yeah. A little bit, my, my. Quite the south, so the, the low country story. Yeah. Beautiful descriptions. Beautiful. Thank you, Tang. Yeah, I like the mystery of, you know, what is the form? What's the form? Yeah, that's nice. Like many of my things, it comes from real life, and I spent a lot of time wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> what is that thing? Yeah. What as a neighbor, thing? as a neighbor said, well, it doesn't smell. <laughs> You do low country descriptions absolutely beautifully, really, Estelle. Really, really well. Yeah. I, I think I, as a writer, I learned. I became a writer when I came to the to the coastal area first, Georgia, mm -hmm. and then and here. We spent a lot of time on the Georgia coast building docks, not much else, but um, just messing around and you know improving property and stuff, and just spending time. And it was a great time to just look and that's where I first started my my first novel it's almost like you have to have that quiet time being withdrawn from a lot of normal things like in a Atlanta which is where I was living so yeah yeah I think that's true for many of us it really is yeah yeah you reach a, a, a point where you can't write anymore and you just walk out and you know always nature's doing something you yeah. know that takes your mind off of it gives you an idea of whatever yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think I'm next, right, Brooke? Brooke's, um, Brooke's muted. She's oh, muted. Okay. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
I well, said thanks, Estelle, and then I said, thank you. Sir, are you ready? <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Yes, I am ready. Uh, this piece actually comes from the workshop, the Burning Man versus the Tortoises. So, uh, Brooke, you had asked us to make a list of memories. And um, Jonathan talked a lot about going deep to dive into the subconscious. So this is one of the memories. This is creative nonfiction that came from that workshop. And that workshop was held back in May of this year. <clears throat> uh, Elvis is dead. <clears throat> the apartment complex sidewalk was hot under her feet in the Houston summer sizzle. Layla, 11, draped her swim towel over her left arm. Elvis is dead, Mikey yelled from the second floor porch. No, he's not, Layla said. She pushed her blonde hair back, shielding her brown eyes from the sun. Yes, really, he is. My mom said so. Mikey ran down the stairs. His thin shoulders were pink and peeling, his reddish hair dry and messy. Stop saying things that aren't true, Mikey, Layla said. The news of Elvis would break her dad's heart. Layla loved running in... A, Riding in the car with her dad, windows rolled down while jailhouse rock floated beneath their voices. Layla, I'm not lying, said Mikey. His voice trailed into silence. Layla hugged him. Come on, let's go swimming. Shelly and Minnie are meeting us at the deep end. She grabbed his hand and turned toward the groups of screaming kids and aggravated grown-ups. A portable radio played a Beatles song with intermittent static. Mikey stood anchored. Elvis is dead. Layla unlatched the chain link pool gate. Her heart was in pieces that Elvis died. Her whole world was unraveling, but she played it cool with Mikey to soften his heartbreak too. Where's Marty? Is he coming? She asked. Mikey and Marty were identical twins, 12, both wearing matching black and white swim trunks. Only Marty wore a white t-shirt while swimming. Minnie and Shelley laid their towels parallel to the glass and brick rec center next to the ever wet fiberglass pool slide. Marty tossed his towel onto the deck and planted the perfect cannonball into the deep end. Mikey hung at the pool's edge frowning. Layla lay next to the tinted windows. Come on brother, let's give them the double M jackknife, Marty yelled. Each brother stood at a, dis at a distance on opposite corners of the deck. My Mikey counted down. Three, two, one. They ran toward the center of the eight foot deep pool. They leapt into the air and each hugged a knee in unison. It was as if by magic, their strides and jumps were as identical as their freckled faces. They entered the water in plunging harmony, a diagonal geyser Geyser-like splash erupted between them as if a blue lava volcano reunited with the sky. The cone of the cold water shot past the slide and blasted the hot glass windows of the rec center doors. Both doors shattered into tiny fragments, not breaking. The shards of glass held strong beneath double-sided thick brown tinted film. Kids ran their fingers over the rainbow edge mosaic pieces and stood in awe at the vision of the twins' double M jackknife excellence. Mikey and Marty put their fingers up to their lips to shush their friends. The adults paid no mind to the poolside spectacle. Minnie and Shelley slipped into the deep end while it was empty to enjoy the calm, cool waters. Come on, they said to Layla. Layla noticed something moving at the bottom of the pool. It swayed back and forth. What's that? Layla asked. If it's a person, they're holding their breath a really long time. Minnie and Shelly dove down like pearl divers and pulled up a lifeless little girl. Layla grabbed her thin brown arms, dragged her from the pool and lay her on the back, on her back, just below the slide. The kids circled around her. She looked to be about seven or eight years old. No one knew who she was or how she got into the deep end or even how long she'd been down there. Layla thought she looked like the new girl who had just moved in at the courtyard. Her lids were open, her eyes bloodshot pink, her brown lips bubbled a bulge of yellow mustard phlegm. She wasn't breathing. Layla looked around, desperate for an adult to help. She saw spines of books and magazines and tops of disinterested heads. 
Layla bolted past the slide, jumped high over the sitting pool and blasted through the fence gate. She ran to her own apartment, flew through the back door and found her mom atop the bathroom scale. Call an ambulance, she yelled. The girl drowned in the pool, please mom, call now, hurry. Layla ran to the apartment next door and banged on the door as hard as her fist could manage. She tried the door handle, it was locked. The door opened. Layla panted at the large woman standing in the doorway. Come now, your girl, she drowned. Layla pulled her through the dirt courtyard to the edge of the deep end. Oh God, the girl's mom moaned. She flipped over her onto her stomach, turned her child's head to the side and straddled her legs. She pushed the heels of her hands deep into her back and pressed upward toward her daughter's shoulder blades as if she were rolling out thick bread dough. Layla stepped back at the sound of the horrid grunting, not knowing whose throat it was coming from. The kid's circle wide, widened around them. Layla shifted her gaze to the shattered glass doors and watched everyone's broken reflections as if it were a movie. Liquid expunged from the girl's lungs. Phlegm and pool water puddled beneath the slide. The little girl's throat squawked and squeaked, wincing like it was twisted shut. The music on the portable radio went silent as sirens rang out and a red and white ambulance pulled into the parking lot. The adults around the pool finally took notice. The little girl gasped, coughed, and then vomited just as the rescuers reached her and carried her to the ambulance. Layla, Mikey grabbed Layla's arms. Layla, you jumped clear over the sitting pool in one leap. Marty and me, we've never jumped that far. Oh my God, how did you do that? Layla didn't understand what he was saying. It was a twist of words and sounds and colors and heat. She shut out the noise and watched the ambulance drive away, blinking red and yellow lights. Layla grabbed her swim towel, draped it over her left arm and walked the sidewalk toward home. Alone, she hid in the corner of her dusty front porch, crying quietly into her towel. She knew she needed to be ready to hug her dad when he heard the news about Elvis. Ooh. Ooh. Riveting, Lisa. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's a remarkable story. Oh my gosh. It's Beautifully fine. written. Thank Beautiful. you. Very gripping. Yeah. Well, I did a little bit of math, and Elvis, four days from now, would have been 86 years old. Wow. Isn't that interesting. Yeah. Right. It is August. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's August. Yeah. Oh my, that was something. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Brooke. That was really good. So have you been working on that off and on since May or was it? I have, I have. That's nice. So thank job. you for the inspiration. Yeah, that workshop really, really helped. I love the dive. I love the description yeah. of the dive. Oh yeah. I dove in with you when you did that. Yeah, the movement of the water. Yeah, and yeah, you know, on the glass. Like yeah. yeah. and broken glass. Yeah. That sure. image is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Or Thank the you, yeah. Thank you. Beautifully yeah. done. Yeah. Thank you. And surprising. Yeah. Wow. Oh, lots of changes. Yeah. yeah. All right, Jane, are you ready? I am ready. I am. Um, I'm going to read a, an excerpt from a chapter in my novel set in Boston in 1975. And in this, um, our protagonist, uh, Father Fitzpatrick, has asked for a, an audience with the bishop, who is the, um, he's kind of the power behind the throne um, in the archdiocese. So he has motored up to the, uh, to the archdiocese, the seat of the archdiocese, and will begin there, okay? Bishop Albano came around his massive desk and met him mid-carpet. Father Fitzpatrick, he bellowed, as if the two were old friends. His charm was immediately obvious. His power remained sheathed, not as apparent at first, until he extended his hand and commanded, Monstra te humilitate primum. Father Frank lowered his head, drew the bishop's hand to his lips, and kissed his ring, a sign of his humility and respect for the station, excellency. He would have kissed the ring as a matter of course, 
the stern command from the bishop put him off balance for a moment. The bishop pointed to a chair, returned to the carved wood and red leather one behind his desk, and resumed a conversational tone. His dark eyes, hooded beneath heavy eyebrows, bored into Father Frank's and shook his, his tentative composure. So, why have you requested this meeting, Father? Father Frank had rehearsed his opening, but all his preparations deserted him in that moment. He blurted, I have a confession to make and something the Cardinal will want to be made aware of, Excellency. A confession? Why make your confession to me? I, I looked the other way. I should have done something and I didn't. There's a situation I'm aware of and the Cardinal needs to know. Settle down, Father Fitzpatrick, settle down. What exactly are we talking about? I have knowledge of some altar boys, some altar boys that were, well, I'll say it right out, were fondled by a parish priest at a church I visit. You visit? I help out, say masses there on a relief basis during vacations, that sort of thing. You don't have enough to do at your own parish? A priest there is a friend of mine from seminary days, and we help each other out like that from time to time. His pastor approved it. How long has this alleged behavior been going on, Father? Too long, Excellency, that's my sin, and I need forgiveness for not coming forward before this. I, I just know I have to now. He stared at the Oriental carpet. Father Frank had never felt more like a foolish schoolboy. And why haven't you? Haven't I come forward before this? Father Frank sat quiet gazing over the bishop's shoulder through the heavily draped window. He opened and closed his mouth, then reopened it and said, it took more courage than I had. I kept trying to convince myself my suspicions were wrong. Even when I glimpsed it and actually was told it by one of the kids, I clung to every other possible explanation. Father, Better to look at all like, for all explanations and be sure of your accusation before destroying another priest's reputation. Of course you're right, Excellency, but a boy I know quite well in that parish confirmed it. I trust that boy. He isn't even capable of thinking up such a grotesque thing. What about destroying that child's future? Doesn't that matter? One boy? He said there were more. I mean, Father, you take this all on the word of one boy? No, I, I told you I saw something. Father, have you ever hugged a child? Of course I have, I'm very circumspect, but I'm very circumspect. I'd never touch a child without a parent being there, without their implicit or explicit permission. Bishop Albano's eyes narrowed, and there we have it. You think you're within the bounds of propriety and are therefore in a position to say another priest is not. I wouldn't put it that way, Excellency. I know what I saw and what I heard. Shame on me for not reporting it earlier. There's no absolution needed here, Father Frank. What you're worried about may be a matter open to interpretation. The bishop intertwined his fingers, closing his thumbs and pointing his index fingers upward seeming to contemplate his hands for several long moments. Father Frank was reminded of something the kids in catechism class liked to chant. Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors and out come the people. He was surprised when the bishop spoke suddenly. Enough of this verbal jousting, Father. Perhaps you'll reveal the name of the alleged child molester priest to me for proper inquiry then. Father Linehan, David Linehan. Over there in Brighton, that Father Linehan? Yes, Excellency. And that's where, yes. Very well, leave it with me. I will see to it that there's an investigation and if appropriate, the proper action is taken. Understand that Holy Mother Church has a lot at stake here. I understand, Excellency. My immediate concern though is that boys will be safe. We may need to offer them counseling. Leave it all in my hands. The intercom buzzed, 
Bishop Albano glanced at his watch and stood, indicating the door. He flashed the disarming smile for which he was known, lowered his voice as they reached the inner vestibule and spoke in a more familiar tone. Frank, I know I can count on your complete discretion, not a word to anyone. Let us handle this. It's an extremely delicate matter, you understand? Of course, Excellency. The bishop turned his back then and strode to the desk when the intercom buzzed, buzzed for a second time. He executed a backhanded wave. See yourself out. Father Frank stood in the deep archway at the chamber door, closed behind him. He wondered if he should make another appointment. The seminarian glanced up, answering the question on his face before he could form the words. Bishop Albano will be in touch with you if he needs to see you again, Father. Thus dismissed, he descended the curving staircase, his stomach sinking further with each carpeted step. Outside of the chancery, he stood under the porte cochere, staring straight ahead, wrestling twin desires for a strong drink and a quick trip to a chapel. Most of all, he wanted to wash his hands. He felt unsatisfied and dirty somehow. A twinge of pain made him look down. He saw that he'd been gripping his car keys so tightly that the metal praying hands on, the, on his key ring had left deep impressions of the Lord's fingers in his fist. Small droplets of blood beaded in his palm. Father Frank pulled a cloth handkerchief from his back pants pocket, swiped away the blood, and headed for his car. I get it, Lord, he sighed. This is just the first strike. It may be a long battle. That's it. <laughs> oh, Jane, that, that is just exquisite. <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm taking a peek into the past. Ooh. Taking a peek into an institution. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. What a timely topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jill, it's chilly. Yeah, yeah. it's a little chilling. Um, this takes place in 1975 uh, in a book called Every Strike Brings You Closer to the Next Home Run. And uh, it's about all of the challenges that the characters, there are several characters, and about how they resolve them. And this is Father Frank's um, particular dilemma. Yeah, so anyway. That's Ooh, very good. Yeah. Yes. Right there. Mm. Well, that's a hard act to follow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I <Okay. can't> agree. <laughs> I'll break, I'll break the spell a little bit with some poetry, although um, this poem has a, a bit of a narrative quality to it. Um, I have two poems I'd like to share. One's a little longish and the other's quite short. Oh, um, Jackie, real quick. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just was um, gonna let Emily know that she was next and then uh, Catherine, uh, you're next after Emily. And then Susan Crow, are you reading? No, first timer, just wanted to listen in. This okay, time. maybe you should be, join us next month and read something. I may do that. All right, and I think Kathy Bradford, are you just listening? No, she's just, just, she's just here to tell me I did a great job. Oh, okay, all right. We can do that. Right. So I guess after Jackie, we have uh, Emily and Catherine, and Barb, you said you're just, Listening. Listening. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Jackie. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. Give me a little break there. Okay. This is a poem that I really uh, am working on around the, the idea of a sense of place. And so this is going to go back way before even um, Barry's piece. It's called Juan's Texaco. Juan from Puerto Rico waves to us from the red and white gas pumps. Flying horse flickers above his head. We pass by the corner of Elmont and Capac roads on our way home from the one room schoolhouse. Look both ways before you cross the street, the school poster warns us, and we do. My sister Di and brother Dewey Ride the bus to Capac High, seven miles on the paved road, 
past the Christie's farm. After school, brother hitchhikes to Almont to visit his sweetheart four miles down the paved road. Back this way on Almont Road turned gravel, old Clyde on the stoop of his shingled brown shack coaches me as I wobble on the hand-me-down bike. Opposite Clyde looms the faded yellow haunted house of peeling paint we live in. Weeping willow up front, mid-yard the stump of a box elder, we sit for photographs. Down Capeback Road the other way, past the huge black walnut tree and the weathered barn stands Mrs. Klein's grocery. A few more steps to the town tavern. We live on five acres, long, out of use farm, defunct orchard, abandoned chicken coop, a red shed where the coal is kept, nearby a sad pear tree. Our house sits kitty corner from Wand's store, penny candy jackpot and gas oasis for cars that pass by that dark cold place. Nine children, bitter winters and nightmares. Mother at the stove, steam rising from potatoes boiling, meatloaf in the oven. Dad soon home from work. Next morning, I watch her run diapers through the old washer's ringer, hang them on a clothesline strung through the upstairs hall when blizzards freeze rope outside until at last springs of forsythia and lilac blooms return. She works the dark soil in Michigan twilight. Summers of canning, little helpers, husk corn, peel hot tomatoes, pluck concord grapes from their bunches, all sealed in colorful jars. Ding, the bell from Juan's Texaco signals travelers on the way to somewhere, anywhere, away from this corner of nowhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Cool. Really nice. Pure sense of place, that's for sure. Yes. yes. Good. Thank you. And then I'm going to read a short poem out of the, the newly released Poetry on the Comet, um, Ed Madden. Poet Laureate of Columbia, South Carolina, is the curator for this, this book. And uh, these poems are going to be on the Midlands transit system. Um, and this year, his theme was, I had one on the, the bus last year. I think it was last year. Could have been 2019. I don't know if we did it last year. But uh, this one's called When It's Over. This is the, the theme of this book. And here's my poem. It's called After. After the third martini, after my bath, after the last time, again, after my heart, after the cat wakes us, after he leaves, after great joy, after great pain, after the pink azaleas fade, after voices fall silent. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, can, are they going to post that in public places on a metro system, like a bus system? Oh, I yeah, love yeah. That. I guess they're broadsides on the. the oh. This is the Midlands Transit System. Yeah, <laughs> and also Ed is um, is releasing them on Facebook and Twitter. And I didn't even know the first year that he was going to do this nice little chat book. So he did that. Too. Beautiful. That's beautiful. It was, it's a great oh, nice. project. Great project. Where yeah. is that available? The poetry in the comet. Um, I'll have to ask Ed, and I can I can let you know. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, if you're on our social media, for sure. But as far as the little the little uh, book, I don't know where it's might say in here. Do you know Emily? I think Emily's got a. Poem. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately. Um, but they're, I think they're already on the buses in Columbia, so you could just oh, get on the buses. 
Yeah. That is so cool. That is That'd be worth really a trip cool. to Columbia. I'd it's a great that. project. It's, it's really fun. cool. It's a really fun project. Um, at the moment, I'm not. Oh, I think last year the um, the theme was about time, and uh, so it was fun. It's, and there's a limit to just to ten lines to the poem, so they can be easily read, I guess, on a short ride on the bus, and um, so pretty cool. And, yeah. Curator of that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great reading, Jackie. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> As usual. Um, okay, I guess I'll go now. I'm on my phone, so I'm really, I'm sorry I've been able to like properly clap for people or anything, and I've been off most <laughs> of the time because it's awkward holding the phone. Um, but all right, so I also, like Jackie, got a, was privileged enough to have a, a poem on the bus systems in Columbia. So I'll read you that poem, and then I'm going to read like another new poem. Um, so this is when the cord that tied us is cut. This is on the buses. When the cord that tied us is cut and rises up in the road like a cobra, ready to spit at the wind that will carry it away, let it be put to good use a tightrope for ants to carry blossoms over busy streets, double bind old sneakers hanging from a power line so that when they fall, they hit the ground running together, a bungee cord for baby birds, a fiber on a frayed rope of moonlight pulling the last ferry, a stitch stepped on in a patch of sunlight, let it be found and mistaken for the golden thread of wisdom. Oh, wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, this is my newest poem, and it's probably uh, one of my lightest poems, I would say. There's a little darkness in there, but uh, all right. To my kitchen designer on his birthday. It's for Christopher. To find you, I could stroll through the dead forest style, breathe in your favorite smells, the dying breath of rosewood, bobinga, greenheart, zebra. Their price is going up each day from fire, disease. How these planks make me feel locked out of woods. The way touching a pelt makes me feel far from a fox. I take the aisle of lights and wonder if you turn them on. Your black, brown in the sun hair and dark eyes. But light is blind. Your scent must make it glow like the steam of jasmine rice, earthy and sweet, you still carry the musk of the elephant that chose you to ride her. Some chandeliers here look as alive as wild mushrooms and are as loud as saxophones. I'm a shrill whistle wearing the yellow safety vest you bought me in case my car breaks down. You think of everything. I think of silly jokes to surprise you, make your heart bloom like mine when I see you at your desk wearing a red polo and orange apron. I hold back. For once I'm early, left sushi in my car for our date with ducklings, tiniest stained teacups at Wendy's Park. They can wait. We have all the time. I watch you work, click, click, clicking your mouse, drag a dishwater, drag a dishwasher away from a fridge, a stove away from a wall, a fire hazard you warn. Has a customer ever said, put yourself in my kitchen? I've had you in my kitchen, standing at the sink, soaping dishes, holding my bowl to the light to check that it's clean. You slid a forefinger along its rim and valley. In my head, I heard, this is the father of my children. The rush of water, a memory of the future. Put yourself in our kitchen. When our white bowls are clean, dried and stacked in the bottom cabinet. You insist so I can reach them safely. We hold hands to our bed. You wanted to cut a straight line, but gave in to me again and again, curve the headboard to echo our bodies. We hold each other tight like, the, like those white bowls. Sometimes I reach for one and grab two, and this is how they could break. You warn, no shatter into dust. In bed surrounded by shadows, I feel you teeter on the wire of sleep and it's my turn to worry. What if 
I ask, what is you answer? What is is a closet of your red polos on wood hangers that told me you are mine even before my blouse is pressed against them? What is a dog named Peanut that sleeps at our feet while love purrs into our heads and bliss curls up like a black and white question between us? What is turquoise and pink tiled camellias, such an impractical sink, you advised against it, can't tell if it's clean, and yet each morning you reach down, pretend to pluck a flower and put it behind my ear. What is this sweetness, this love? Oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what a beautiful oh, oh. domestic oh. happiness. It's luscious. It's just yeah. luscious. Love it. Oh, wow. Beautiful. That's for Christopher. <laughs> I, I miss you, Emily. I miss that beautiful poetry of yours lately. And Brooke, I miss yours too, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Is Brooke ever going to read again? Make her read, Emily. <laughs> Read, Brooke, read. <laughs> you have to read, Brooke. You can't make me do it from there. You have to come here. <laughs> uh, that was really, 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 really good. Beautiful, Emily. Oh, yeah. Very I, love, nice. yeah, I love black hair that shines brown in the sun. That's such a lovely image. Uh, just yeah, beautiful. that was beautiful. Mm. Emily, so, yeah. I, hope you, I hope you can join us from Holland's from time to time. And read, no, us I will. Wonder, read us all the wonderful new poems you'll be writing every day. <laughs> where are you, Emily? I will. Yeah, where are you, Emily? Where is Emily? <laughs> I'm on Distant Island. I'm in Beaufort. I'm not far. Oh. I don't. I won't move till for another two weeks, like the 24th of August. But yeah, I'll definitely. If we're gonna keep this on Zoom, then I'll be zooming with you again. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Are you gonna teach at Holland's? You teaching there? Um, no, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be an MFA student. So oh, you could teach them. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully next year te teaching the second year. Yeah. Oh. I'm following in Brooks' footsteps. <laughs> so beautiful there. Oh, oh. Thank you. So envious of that. Yeah, that's great. Good luck. Thank you. Too bad we weren't there together. That would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, good luck on your great new adventure. Thank We're you. Of. Yes. Thanks. Yes. All right. I think we have Catherine next. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Catherine Tandy, yep. Graham. Yes. Same one. Yes. I'm going to read an excerpt from a memoir about my mom called Anne Queen of the Wing Chair. And this this part of a chapter evolved from a workshop I went to a couple of summers ago um, in North Carolina. And the question that the instructor gave us was, um, what formed your character? And my character is my mother. And turns out her father committed suicide when she was 12. And, and it affected her greatly um, in a really, it's an, unusual way. Anyway, so here we go. This is called Will, which was her father's name. And let's see if I can get where I need to go here. Oops. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh shoot. I just closed what I needed. Sorry. Okay, here we go. All right. Will. This is called Will's Death. That Sunday morning, the ding of the doorbell jolted Anne from sleep into groggy. Her mother's footsteps hurried down the stairs, the clack of the night lock unbolting and swish of the front door opening. Hushed, sad voices in the living room. A man, her mother, another woman. The words will, golf course, and gun jolted her awake. Fear prickled her skin, though she didn't know why. Then a tiny cry and low moan. Anne knew it was her mother. Her eyes sprang wide. Early daylight peeped through the blinds of the front guest room, hers for the summer, an adventurous vacation from her upstairs bedroom with the maple tree just outside. 
An attic fan sucked every whisper of breeze from the alley between her house and Aunt Lizzie's, making for cooler downstairs sleeping. Anne clutched a handful of soft summer blanket to her chest, turned her head toward the voices and held her breath so she could discern what the grown-ups were saying. Will was father. Of course she knew that, but the golf part made no sense. Only muffled sounds emerged from the next room. Screwing up her courage, she slid from under the covers, crept a barefoot to the door and pressed her ear against the crack. Is Anne still asleep? The Mississippi drawl had to be Miss Jane Gaither's. Then her mother's reply, teary, broken. I'm sure she is. She never gets up before eight. A pause, then the male voice. Sit over here, Marty. Anne could hear soft weeping. Another pause, the man again, assured, practical. He was dead when the golfers found him. He'd shot himself, then fallen off the bench right at the first tee. Gunshot to the head, gun was still in his hand. Dr. Gaither, who'd started the hospital down 17th Street. Her 12-year-old mind couldn't grasp his story. Were they talking about father? They couldn't be. He never played golf in the morning. He was only back from his job in St. Louis on weekends. He slept late on Sunday mornings. Mama cooked a big breakfast, then walked Ann downtown to the Baptist church. Like he would today, as soon as he was up and about, she knew he'd come downstairs and wake her with an ebullient and how's the prettiest sleepy head in the world today? And he'd scoop her out of bed and whirl her around the room. Her giggle box would turn over and he'd carry her like Cleopatra into the breakfast room for a cup of Cambric tea. And she'd sip until Murdy hipped open the swinging door from the kitchen and grandly placed on the table a platter of scrambled eggs, crisp bacon and hot biscuits with homemade strawberry jam. Today wouldn't be any different, she thought, would it? The sneeze caught her off guard. She hadn't meant to. Hadn't wanted to be found listening. Anne padded, lickety split across the room, leapt into bed, turned toward the window and pulled the covers over her head. She pretended to be asleep. The bedroom door creaked open. Anne, Anne, honey, are you awake? Her mother's shaky voice. The child lay still as stone. In her maternal wisdom, Murdy intuited that Anne was awake and had likely heard much of the adult's conversation. She inhaled, willing her voice to be strong. And she began, I know you're awake, honey. Roll on over so I can hold you and tell you what I know. The little girl hesitated, then followed her mother's instructions. For a few moments, Murdy rocked her daughter wordlessly as tears flowed, tears flowed from her own eyes. In a while, she hugged Anne gently and urged, look at me, sweetie. She complied and her mother cupped a small cheek in her calloused hand. Though the child's eyes were dry, they held a look of confusion and her brows were wrinkled with unstated questions. Your father has gone to heaven to live this morning, my dear baby, and he won't be coming back to us. Murdy's voice cracked on us and she cleared her throat. Anne listened quietly, her eyes engaged with her mother's. Do you have any questions? Murdy finger combed her daughter's dark waves back from her face. Why did Dr. Gaither say gun, mama? The grieving widow took a deep breath before responding. Her mind flashed to Will's drinking problem that had been growing worse the past few months. Dr. Gaither had been caring enough to relate local men talk to her about her husband having installed a paramour in his St. Louis apartment during his Monday through Friday work week as a pharmaceutical salesman. Because Murdy was a staunch church going Baptist, the good doc knew she'd never consider divorce. Hopkinsville folks who knew her admired this tall, upstanding, lonely lady as a talented craftsperson, terrific cook, and doting mother of an only child. Dr. Gaither wanted her to know the truth about her husband for her sake and that of her daughter. He'd, have an, he'd had an inkling that something of this nature could happen and thought enough of her to want her to be prepared. And I'll stop there. Wow. Wow. My, my, my. He really did that? Like uh, he was sitting at the golf course? Yes, he really did, actually. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But wow. You, uh, you got into her head so well, both the mother and the daughter. That was, that was a wonderful scene. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Really wonderful, Catherine. That must have been very difficult to write. You know, 
it kind of rolled out. It's something I had not thought about. That that assignment, it you know, isn't it amazing how an assignment, well, Lisa, like like you did, an assignment from your from your workshop. That right. assignment just opened this whole memoir for me because I hadn't, I really hadn't thought about what had shaped her. And now, oh yes, I'm sure that did. So it, it was very, very helpful uh, to do that. Very helpful. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. That was beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Catherine. You're always real sensitive to your mother, but um, you know, this this has to be a very difficult point in her in her life. Yeah, well, I'm sure it was. Yeah. It's interesting. She was embarrassed. She was for for years, she was embarrassed. She because nobody else's father committed suicide and she she did not want to be the one. So mm -hmm. Yeah, it affected her profoundly in that way, I'm sure. Oh, there's, I had two friends whose parents killed themselves and there there was a never talked about because there was just this profound shame. That, and, and you felt it, you knew it, you sensed it. Wow, wow. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. This writing this memoir is helping me to know my mother better. I, I had no idea that would happen, but gosh, it's a it's a fascinating um, journey, fascinating experience. She passed away a while back, but yeah, it's a fascinating journey. It's a way to keep her with you. Yeah. Yes, it it's is. It's a way to keep her. and to get to know her better. I mean, it's it's just pretty cool experience. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I think you're doing some great psychological work. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. And I think that was the first time we've seen your pup. First time I've seen it briefly. Oh, this is not my I'm I'm pet sitting. Oh. I okay. had to keep I had to keep this little girl in my lap because she wanted to get down and bark. She uh, really, ah. she she was been so good the entire evening. Oh, I see until, her. I don't see her. Emily, well, she's out of my lap now. She really oh. wanted to get down, so I was kind of struggling to hold her while I was reading. <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, I don't think I've ever seen a dog in Catherine's lap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one. <laughs> so. Actually, there are two. The other one is asleep. This one is not. <laughs> oh, what fun. What fun. It is uh, fun. It's great. Yeah, that would be great fun. Enjoying the little girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're at your house. You no, go to their house. You're I'm at their, their house. house. I'm in their house. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to now introduce our featured writer, Susan. Um, if she, are you ready? <laughs> okay. After teaching literature, composition, and creative writing to thousands of AP high school and college students for 33 years. Susan Beckham Zorinda turned her attention to putting a novel in her heart on paper. The genesis of which was a short story that won the South Carolina Fiction Prize. Her debut novel, Bells for Eli, Mercer University Press, has been selected as the 2021 first place winner for the first book fiction in the Independent Publisher Book Awards. A 2020 Ford Indie Book Award finalist, a winter 2020 okra pig by the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, a 2020 finalist in American Book Fest Best Book Awards, 2020 Notable Indian Shelf Unbound, and was nominated for a 2021 Pushcart Prize. Wow. Hey. Susan, <laughs> Susan <Yeah>. has uh, <laughs> published numerous short stories and won a number of awards for her short fiction. She lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina with her husband, Wayne. And of course, you can learn more at susanzarenda.com. Thank you, Brooke, so much. And um, thank you for inviting me to, to read this evening. And wow, I have really enjoyed everything. And it's there's a bit of a theme going on with us hearkening back to the 60s and 70s and Elvis. Um, uh, and, and Bells for Eli takes place in a small fictitious town that I named Green Branch. South Carolina, and it, it does take place in the 60s and 70s, and is the story of Delia and Eli, first cousins who grow up across the street from each other oh. 
and grow inordinately close, um, but not just because they live across the street. Eli has a tragic accident, and that's what I'm going to read in the first chapter. And as a result of that, these cousins grow um, in, into an unconditional love, really. And it, the book takes you through their their college years through an, an awful lot of conflict and of, of their feelings for each other and a lot of conflicts of the era and, and so forth. But I thought I would read um, just chapter one from Bells for Eli because it um, puts the plot into action. First, you have to find it. So this, it actually starts June, 1959. The day before Eli's third birthday, in early morning with the heat yet bearable. Mama and I dug in the soil along the stepping stones to our front door. She wielded a spade and I dug with a spoon. On June 4th, it was late in the season to plant summer flowers, but I wanted them and my mother surrendered. The day before, Mama has told me the prophetic story many times, I picked a stalk from white feathery wildflowers in the corner of our lot and walked across the street to show Mary Lily. My aunt was working among her flowering perennials, phlox, columbine, and salvia, the names exotic and the blossoms alluring. Oh, Adeline, she exclaimed, you have Queen Anne's lace blooming early this year. There's not a wildflower that grows more beautiful. I imagine her sweeping her arms open in that way she has, as though she is gliding through water. She told me then a legend of the dark purplish red in the center of Queen Anne's lace, that it formed when a magic queen spinning lace petals onto the flower pricked her finger and spilled a single drop of blood. I was sad that such a lovely creation bore this stain and she soothed me by saying the blemish was the heart of the flower's beauty. I want to grow flowers like you, I told Mary Lily. She called my mother that evening and the next morning we made a trip to the garden store. Some people can retain early memories, but for me, this is not true. For me, the day of the marigolds is my only detailed memory during the year when I was just over midway to my fourth birthday. I can close my eyes and still see the half planted row of robust orange plants laid out along the stones, the only flowers I've ever known my mother to put into the earth. The other half remained undisturbed in their little plastic cartons. I am exactly seven months older than Eli. My birthday is November 5th. Had I been born several days earlier, I would have been a grade ahead of my cousin. Instead, by missing the November 1st deadline, I was the oldest in my class. We thought those few days connecting Eli and me according to grade were a fortune of fate. It was our parents who put the idea into our young heads for they knew how a moment changed everything. How devotion might be born from catastrophe. I was patting dirt around a seedling while mama held the fragile stalk steady when a loud and alarming cry shook us from our task. We looked up to see Pot, he'd been working in the yard, run from the side door of the Winfield house with Eli in his arms. Mary Lily stood on the front porch watering ferns and I watched her wide skirt fan out into a circle as she nearly stumbled in her haste down the white wooden steps toward Pot. Her straw hat flopped down low over her forehead. Mama pulled off her gardening gloves and I tried to dash across the street, but she caught me. No, Delia, she said. Her hands were tight on my shoulders. Something's wrong with Eli, I wailed. Whatever it is, we don't need to hamper them, she said. My mother shoved the new gardening gloves into the waistband of her blue check pedal pushers. I liked seeing my mama relaxed in her pedal pushers because in those days, she nearly always wore a dress. She wasn't so fixed up as June Cleaver, but she did wear perpetually the same shirt waist dresses cinched with a narrow belt, coupled with an apron around her middle. Mama took my hand, hers was damp. Together, we hurried to the edge of our front yard, close enough to hear, but we did not cross the street. Pot had caught up to Mary Lily at the bottom of the steps. We were in hearing range, but he talked so fast, I had to grasp at phrases. Pot Hawkins works for the Winfields, but to say he's their gardener hardly begins to identify his place in their world. His family has been connected to Mary Lily's maybe since the end of slavery. All I know, 
is he and his mother, Caro, have lived in their little house out in the country on Lauderdale land all my life. That red devil lie in the Coca-Cola bottle Mr. Gene Dunn left on the back stoop, I heard him say, for them balloons. And then for a while, I could not follow the words until I heard Mr. Eli drunk some of it. I heard Eli breathing, even from across the street. I thought he was choking because his face was contorted, his cheeks sucking in. My God, oh God, help me, Pot. Get Ellison into the house. Milk, he needs milk, Mary Lily screamed. My mother began to run toward our house, pulling me by the hand. What is Red Devil Lie, I sputtered as I slipped and staggered alongside her, trying to keep my arm in its socket, but she didn't answer. Inside the house, she made a call and I heard her say the name of our street. Then she sat with her head in her hands. What is Red Devil Lie, I asked again. It cleans drains, but my brother must have been using it to blow up balloons for the party. Did Uncle Gene hurt Eli? I asked. I'm sorry, baby, she said and smoothed my hair. I can't explain it. I have to be quiet and think what to do. She picked up a pencil and paper and began to write. The next thing I remember was the deafening shriek of the ambulance siren and mama jolting from her chair. Again, she grabbed my hand and began to run. I kept up better this time and unlike before, we crossed the street, yet we stood back waiting. I watched terrified as two men in white waist-length coats brought Eli out on a stretcher. His arms bent in at the elbows and stuck out like wings. I saw his mouth opening and closing and then he vomited on himself. I heard him heaving. One of the men took the bottom of the sheet covering Eli and wiped away the yellow spew. Mary Lily heard behind, hurried behind the stretcher, but before she climbed into the ambulance, she looked toward Mama. She was crying while she talked. Call Dr. Crawford and tell him we're on our way to the hospital in Columbia, not Green Branch. My mother and about everyone else in town worshiped Dr. Crawford. He had stayed with my mother the whole 24 hours she was in labor with me, napping on a cot nearby. As a child, I loved our doctor, but I feared him too for visits to his office often resulted in a painful shock of penicillin. Even with a temperature of 103 degrees and a throat so swollen with pus, I could hardly swallow without tears. I was never so sick that I didn't dread the needle burning into my hip. So with the mention of Dr. Crawford, I knew Eli must be very sick. The ambulance turned on its siren again and pulled away from the curb. Mary Lily and Pot and Eli were all inside. Suddenly the vehicle stopped and Mary Lily opened the back door and leaned out calling to mama, dear God, Jeanette, find Jean, tell him. And then the ambulance was gone, carrying Eli away in a loud <coughs> of wheels and warning bells. Tell him what? I asked mama. Tell him Eli has had an accident, she said. Her face pulled to taunt with something like reproach or maybe it was only sorrow and fear. I was too young to define it. Yet I remember the way her eyes stared out at nothing, her mouth open and grimaced, and knowing somehow she was thinking about both Eli and Uncle Gene. What is wrong with him? I asked. Her head snapped around. The lie. It's likely burned everything in its path through his body, she said. He's burned like in a fire? I asked. Maybe there was fear in my voice, because Mama clamped shut and would say nothing more. She looked at me curiously, but she didn't speak. Young as I was, I recognized she had told me a gruesome truth she hadn't meant to tell her child. Mama had to go inside to make calls to find her brother. Let me stay out here, I said. She looked at me sternly, but relented. Don't dare leave this yard. I'll watch out the window, she said. I thought about my cousin Eli how poison going down your throat would feel if it burned everything on its way. Like fire, it would turn things black. Your tongue, your throat, and maybe your veins would turn from blue to black. I'd seen what weed poison did to plants in Mary Lily's garden. Pot never let us come near when he sprayed, but I'd seen afterward what it did to once green life. It turned things brown and dry, then black like ash, and then, they were dead. I stared at the spot where the ambulance had parked. I wiped at my eyes. 
But when I noticed the arc of blue, green, and violet spread in the road, rainbow oil lying slick in a thin puddle settled in a dip in the street from a thunderstorm during the night, I felt consoled. Because I knew the meaning of rainbows, I would not imagine Eli turning to black ashes inside, even as my own throat clenched, feeling charred and dry. Ooh. That is chapter one. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow, that was wonderful. You all are kind. It was, so like watching, it was like watching a movie. Oh, oh, you're very oh, kind. Gosh. Your powers of observation are so intense. Well, I thank you. It, yeah, you. I went. You know, it. I. I. I kind of. I went back. You know, I'm a baby boomer, and I went back to that time of of my life. I actually um, don't really have any memories, of course, of how things would have been in the late '50s and early '60s. But um, I was able to interview a couple of gastroenterologists, which will go, you know, goes into the next chapter to find out exactly medically, you know, what Eli would have endured and what the repercussions would have been. Oh my goodness, that was wow. chilling, chilling. Wow. Really exceptional writing. Well Thank read you. too. Thank you. Yeah, yes. well Thank read you. too. Very well read. Yeah. Oh, an old English teacher, you know. <laughs> we never die. <laughs> oh, we never die. That's funny. <laughs> but thank you so much for inviting me to read. I really enjoy being here. Yeah, thank wow. you very much. What a terrific thrill. reading. I, I was thrilled. I'm thrilled. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all can take a lesson from you in the reading. It's really, really perfect. As perfect as the writing. Well, I think I think reading is is <clears throat> is a joy. You know, I've always loved to read silently and aloud, and I think that's true for all of us, or we wouldn't be on the open mic. You know, and mm -hmm. and, and reading is is a very active part of of the whole circle of of, of writing. Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, it's the storyteller part, and, and you get to talk about, or you get to read your story as you wrote it. I mean, as you know it should be. Right, right, right. You imagined it. it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's quite nice. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. So are you going to do the Audible book? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> are you going to do the Audible book? Well, I've, actually, it's done. Um, I, I did not want to do it after I've sat here and said it's, it's a joy to read. It is. But I was, you know, the thought of of reading the whole book was pretty daunting and I didn't want to do it. And my agent said, I don't understand why you wouldn't be the one to do it. You're Southern. Um, you you can read. Oh, you're you need do it so i i did I, I i i did the reading um and it it it, it takes a long time to read it <laughs> but i can't imagine another soul having read that as well as you did I'm oh just, you're so kind thank you oh. well it's a southern protagonist delia's a southern girl and mm -hmm. that's what i am so you know if i if i were if it were a midwestern story it'd be a whole different ball game <laughs> Susan, who were you published by and how did you find your publisher? Um, I'm published by Mercer University Press in Georgia. They are a okay. wonderful, isn't this a beautiful cover? I mean, I have nothing to yes. do with it, so I can say that unabashedly. They, they do some of the prettiest covers of any publisher, I think, in America. Um, that, uh, my, my agent shot the book um, at, at Big Houses for a while. And I got kind of restless and I just, one day I, I said to her, I just think because it's kind of literary fiction more than it is commercial fiction. And, or at least that's the category it's been put in. And I said, I really think we ought to just query some independent presses and, and see what happens. I said, there won't be much money in it, but, and especially not for you, my agent, whom I'm like a whole lot. But she agreed and so sent it out to independent publishers and, and we got two or three 
offers pretty quickly. And I just decided on Mercer because they are, they've been around a long time. They are reputable. Um, they published Jimmy Carter's books. Um, they're just a fine job. <laughs> and you, you, you know the folks at Mercer, they're, they're fine oh. folks. That's great. Neat. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Susan. And yeah, well, that's a really, really good press. Well, thank you, Brooke. I, I yeah. appreciate the opportunity to, to share, to share chapter one. All right. Well, I guess that concludes our open mic. Um, I hope you all join us next month. It comes, it always comes so quick when you live by open mics. <laughs> <laughs> the next month, and it's the next month, and then it's like, oh man, the year's gone by, but we've had a good time. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Susan, for uh, being our featured writer, and thank you all for uh, coming to read. And I hope you'll all come and read next time, Susan uh, Crow. Maybe you'll read for us next time. We'll see. <laughs> what, what's the date? Is it always? Um, it's always the second Thursday of every month. So that's on the, I'll have to look. I always have to look because I can never. Um, that will be uh, the 9th, September 9th. Wow. Okay. Yeah. September 9th. Fall <laughs> is on its way and I'm very excited. It's way too hot. Oh. Yay. Although it won't be cool here until like January, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah. October usually. Middle of October. Yeah. We hope so. If you're lucky. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, all the writers. Yeah. Thank you to the Pat Conroy Literary Center open mic night. This was fabulous. Oh. Enjoy yeah. everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.